I've had so many conversations in the last few weeks about this. And uh, many of you uh, are, are, have voted yes and are excited about this with great reasons. And several people voted no with equally great reasons. It's funny, I convert some conversations with some people say, why are we moving so slowly? And other people, why are we moving so quickly? How do those two pick up today and decide to walk together? In a group like this, in any group, when a big decision is made, there will always be people in the end that are ecstatic. And there will always be people that are frustrated and maybe angry. Whether we announced a yes vote or a no vote today, as I said a couple of weeks ago, there is something far more important than that. As followers of Christ, regardless of how we feel about this, uh, we need to maintain a godly attitude, a God-honoring respect, a Christ-like character, and the importance of the unity of the body of Christ. Because we are family, we are a living, breathing body, we must protect our integrity and fight for togetherness, for unity. And we may disagree as we voted. But it's God's plan that either way, that we move together in a God-honoring way. So I'll tell you, yes, uh, in all honesty, that whether we voted yes or whether we had voted no, the passage of Scripture and the message that I'm looking at today would be the same message. Something far more important than whether we build or don't build, that every one of us needs to assume the same posture whether excited, excited or feeling defeated this morning. This is God's way for his church. So will you pull out your Bibles? And if you don't have one, feel free to go back by the lighthouse. There's Bibles there. Grab one. And we are going to center around about three pages of Scripture in 1 Corinthians. And uh, Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth um, it's a very familiar passage we're going to start with about the body of Christ. Let me pray. Uh, Father, we have nothing if you are not honored. We have asked all along for you to reveal your plan. And so we have to assume that you have revealed it. We have asked that you would speak to your people as we honestly sought you, so we will assume you're in, you're in control, that you've got this, that you are a big God far beyond our dreams. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart has imagined what you have prepared for those who love you. So God, we come to you. Some excited and some frustrated, but we are one body. We are your church. Protect the integrity of your church. As we look into your word now, and we look into an ancient church that had ridiculous discord and strife, would you show us your heart for living well in honoring you in the midst of differing viewpoints? May we see your heart, Father. May we respond according to your perfect word. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you got 1 Corinthians? Let me give you a little bit of context here. This, this church in Corinth had a variety of struggles in their church. And somewhere around, right around 50 AD, Paul on his missionary journey founded the church in Corinth. And then by 54 AD, just four years later, he writes a letter to them that we don't have a copy of. Through uh, early history, this letter was not copied and it wasn't uh, printed and it wasn't... Uh, uh, deemed worthy of, of holding for whatever reason. But he writes a letter to them in 54. And then in 55, Paul writes a second letter. That's this one, the one we call 1 Corinthians. And it's completely from beginning to end dealing with issues in the church. So something was clearly going on in this church. And then a year later, um, he visits Corinth again. And, and historically, this is called the painful visit. Huh. So he writes a letter to them, you know, uh, 16 chapters talking about issues in the church, and then he has a painful visit. That later that same year in 56, he writes a third letter, 
that one's also lost. And then he writes, uh, or he visits again in 56, and then later again in 56, he writes another letter. We have that one, 2 Corinthians. And clearly, there was stuff going on in this church. It got a lot of Paul's attention. It's interesting, if, if you want a really clear perspective of this, read through the whole book of 1 Corinthians. Take out the chapter divisions and the paragraph divisions. Read it like a letter. It was a letter that he wrote. Uh, it, it'll take you about 20 minutes to read. But what a great picture. Uh, he builds this argument that starts with all this turmoil and this discord, and he ends up on one thing, and it's a beautiful picture. So there was lack of unity, there was divisions, there was disagreements, and a lot of that festered into really ugly problems. And the division was killing this church. So this letter, he helps them focus on what's most important. He says at the very, very beginning, Christ is our focus. We all agree on that. He says at the very beginning that sharing the gospel is our mandate. and We all agree on that. But he says in these things, there's an awful lot of wisdom needed. And then the page, next pages, he deals with somewhere 15 to 20 different issues in the church. He deals with people arguing over who the real leader is. He, he, he talks about the wise decisions by men versus discerning from God. He talks about how some thought they were acting in wisdoms. In, some people made decisions acting in wisdom, but other people felt the opposite was wisdom. He gets into sin issues and behavior that was causing rifts. There was even lawsuits in the church and marriage problems. People forcing their personal convictions on others. They had issues with what was okay to eat or drink or what was not okay to do. People claiming their rights, putting things in the church as disproportionately important. It was one of the first churches that anywhere that treated women equally. And women could be full participants in every aspect of the church. And then there was arguments over whether the women had to wear head coverings or not. They disagreed on how they celebrated communion, on who was more important than others. They disagreed on the order and the content of their worship services. They, in, they, they disagreed on doctrinal issues, even on the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And finally, they argued over collecting money. Boy, what a long list of church problems. That's a church in some deep conflict. All of that was, was big trouble, and this church was messed up. You want a summary of the first letter of the, of, to the church in Corinth? People. It's made up of people. It would be the best thing in the world if it wasn't for the people. But people looking out for their own interest. That's the core to this thing. So this whole book, Paul goes straight at that. And somebody in church history, it's been used so many times that I don't, couldn't even find who originally said it. But the, the phrase, to dwell with the saints above, that will be glory. But to live with the saints below, that's a different story. That's the whole book of 1 Corinthians in a nutshell. So I want us to look at four pieces today, and already time is zipping by, so I'm going to try to be quick through this. I'm going to start right in the middle of the book. We're going to go right to chapter 12. It is a really popular passage. Let me read it for you, and I may skip some of my explanation part here because it really is pretty self-explanatory in a lot of ways. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I want to start at verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks or slaves or free, and we're all made to drink one from one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not the hand and not belong to the body, would that make it any less a part of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? 
But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor can the head say to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. I don't need to describe a lot about our body. We have one soul, one brain, one nose, one mouth, two eyes, two ears, limbs, fingers, toes, underarms, knees, elbows, kidneys, thyroid, 206 bones, over 600 muscles, takes 10 muscles just to coordinate to smile. It takes 67 muscles just to come together, to work together just to bite an apple. Blood cells enough to circle the earth twice. Over 40 trillion cells, each having specific function in order to keep your body in functional equilibrium. And so, Paul compares the church to a body, maybe just as complex, maybe just as simple. In this church in Corinth, they had many different parts. As we see in verse 13, there was Jews and Greeks, there was Romans, there was slaves, there was rich, there was poor, there's married, there's single, there's old, there's young, all one body. But what we see, this church had a horrible time making that work. And in verse 14 to 21, I don't need you. Some are more up front, some are behind the scenes, all different, all forced together to figure it out. Verse 24 and 25, a key phrase, God composed it all. Why? It says right there, so that there would be no divisions. Well, how does that work? All of these differences, actually every one of our differences has potential to cause division. So what if I told you that was God's plan? He created us all very different, very unique, to demonstrate how great he is. And how all of these different things, with different opinions and different passions and different drives and different perspectives... How we so simply can all get along in our differences. I think that here in our church, we probably have more diversity in background than that church did. And I'm not talking ethnicity. Look around. We don't have a lot of variety that way. But we have so much diversity in church background. And even the ones I know of, we have Pentecostals and United and Presbyterian and Anglican and Catholic and Baptist and Alliance and Salvation Army and Missionary Church, Reformed, Mennonite, Amish, Church of Christ, Muslim, Mormon, and in a couple of weeks we're going to baptize a teenager who comes from a Hare Krishna family. I'm not sure we have anybody here from a Brethren in Christ background. (laughs) We have many people with no church background. We don't all think the same. And that's okay. I think actually that that's a beautiful picture of what heaven is going to be like. This needs to be an asset to us, not a liability. Now, if you're sitting on the end, under your chair, there's a bowl with some puzzle pieces in it. Would you, if that's there, would you grab that? Would you take one and would you pass it down the row? And at the other end of the row, would you put it under your chair? But I'd like everybody to have a puzzle piece in their hand. And I'm going to ask you actually to to hold on to it, to keep it, and eventually maybe slip it in your pocket. And if you come back next week, bring it with you. Because next week we start a brand new series, a series that will carry us through July. 
And it will be, uh, I'll use this puzzle piece again as an introduction to what we're going to talk about next week. So uh, when everybody has a puzzle piece, I want you to hold it in your hand and to just look at it. Just have a look at it. Every single piece is unique. Every single piece is different. If there were two the same, then one is not necessary. The church is like this. All of us are very unique pieces. Different shape, different color, different picture. But the point is, they have to be interlocked. As long as you are a puzzle piece that's just a standalone puzzle piece, it's nothing. The church is like that. To take a thousand different pieces and interlock them, they come together to paint a picture. And as a church, the picture, when we all come together, is Jesus. In our uniqueness, in our difference, all of that is absolutely necessary to paint the picture of Jesus. And if one piece is missing, the whole thing is incomplete. How frustrating is it to have a thousand piece puzzle but only have 999 pieces? Our differences, our perspectives, our positions, our emotions, our colors and our shapes are God's specific design for you. And problems arise when we want to go our way and others want to go their way. That all sounds good until one of those issues or one of those pieces decides to dig in. This is what Paul is dealing with exactly in Corinth. He uses the example of the body. I'm using the example of the puzzle piece. But what happens when, when, when your body is trying to accomplish something and one part of your body won't do it? What if you're heading to the dinner table and your foot decides, I'm not going? What do you do? You either don't go to the dinner table or you get that foot there, dragging and kicking. Steve Martin and Lily Tomlin years ago had a movie called All of Me. And in a weird movie where they, in this weird thing, they switch bodies and stuff. But my point is, there, there's a season I remember clearly where Steve Martin is heading somewhere. But his body refused. And there's a scene where he's on the street in New York. And there's people buzzing around everywhere. And he's having an argument between his head and his hand. And his hand will not cooperate. So he actually bites his hand trying to force it to come along, trying to get it to cooperate. You know, why doesn't God just put us all with people that are just like us, who think the same, who act the same? You know what? This is the world's number one criticism of Christians. We segregate ourselves by our difference, differences, and it's obvious, and it looks really bad. Go back to the passage Pick up in, in verse 26, where I left off. Uh, if one member suffers, we all suffer. If one is honored, we all rejoice together. Now, you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. And God is appointed in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles and gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Earnestly desire the higher gifts. And look at this next phrase. I will show you a still more excellent way. All right, so page after page after page going through, you've got this problem. Here's how you need to deal with this. You've got this problem. You've got this problem. You've got this problem. You've got this problem. Okay, you're a body. The foot can't say, I'm not going. He says, okay, let me show you the best way. Erase that chapter break there. 
Here's the best way. If I speak with tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith as to move mountains but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Paul is saying, put all of this together and here's the most excellent way, love. Same topic, same thought, same sentence. When we come to chapter 13, don't change the subject. It doesn't matter what we think or our convictions or our gifts or our position, our title, or even how long somebody has been here. Love, that's the better way. So we start in verse 4 here, and we get the description of what love looks like. And this is not a list for a wedding. It works perfectly for that. And and you know what? Whenever I read this, it's actually a really good reminder of how I ought to be acting in my family. And a good reminder uh, about my relationship with my wife. But that's not what Paul is talking about. Get this. How do I know that so clearly? Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13... 14, 15, 16 are all about the church. There's nothing else in this book. He is saying here, in the context of the church, you and I, be patient with one another. In the context of the church, you and I, be kind. No envying, no boasting. Don't be irritating. Don't be resentful. In the church, there's no rejoicing when things go wrong, but celebrate truth. And listen to this. In the context of the church, bear all things. Put up with all kinds of stuff. Believe all things. Always believe the best. Not skeptical skeptical about things. Hope in everything. Endure in everything. He goes on then to talk about gifts and church and orderly worship and the gospel, and preaching, and on and on. That's the only thing 1 Corinthians is about. Let me show you the most excellent way. As a church, is that what we're striving for? If not, we're a clanging cymbal or a noisy gong. We ought to be a living demonstration of Christ's love. I think Paul is saying, if it's self-centered... Or if it's self-regarding, it isn't love. So let's fast forward to the end of the book. Go to chapter 15, the beginning of chapter 15. This, con- this argument he's making about all these issues continues in the same train of thought. And he, he comes down to the end of his argument. I'm going to touch on that and then we'll rewind back. But in chapter 15, verses 1 to 4, he says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached you, unless you believed it in vain, and this is it, for I delivered to you what is first importance. Right? Here's the argument. You got this issue, this issue, this issue. Function in unison, lifting up love as your highest thing, your default position, and under all of it, here's the most important thing. All right? Get this? For I delivered to you the most importance, this is what I received, that Christ died for our sins in according with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised, and on the third day, according to the scriptures. Jesus. The saving work of Jesus on the cross, that is the most important thing. He says to the church in Corinth, agree on this. Focus all your energy on this. Set aside all these other opinions and everything and come together on this. This is the most important thing. Jesus. The truth of Jesus saving grace. Everything else is a secondary issue. Is that not what matters? Is that what grips you more than anything? Is that not really 
why we're all here. The cause trumps differences. The cause of Jesus, his rescue mission to a lost and broken world, that trumps everything. When we put our attention and our resources and our heart and soul into the cause of Christ, we will stand as one. Would you risk everything for the cause of Christ? Would you really put everything in life aside for the good news of Jesus to be spread to the world? Perfect morning to interview Diane. Thank you. Perfect that a year ago, when we planned this series called Be the Church, where we looked at evangelism and discipleship, and know God, become like Jesus, change our world. And we, we chose that June 4th, a year ago, we chose June 4th would be our missions Sunday, that we would have a guest speaker here talking about BIC missions. And we would fill the tent with guests, that that would end up being the week that we ended up voting. Well, that sounds awfully odd. But God, in his sovereignty, think about this. That's beautiful. Because it's the cause of Christ and his gospel and his saving grace message to the world that is the reason we're voting on this in the first place. There's no other reason. I believe that way out of our scope of knowledge, God composed those things in his perfect timing. Okay, we've looked at the body functioning in unison. In love, in the position of excellence, must be our default decision. And Christ is the central focus point of first importance. Where do these three things come together? Turn back to chapter 11. In chapter 11, right in the middle of all of this, an absolutely integral part of the family deal. When they got together, they did something every time to remind themselves, to recognize, to celebrate, and to reiterate that in all our differences, we are family. Let me read it to you. But in the following instructions, verse 17, chapter 11, I, have, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it's not for the better, but it's for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there's divisions among you. And I believe in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine, you can be recognized. When you come together, verse 20, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat, for in eating, each one goes ahead and eats his own meal. When one goes hungry, the other gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was portrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will be guilty concerning the body and blood of Christ. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat the bread and drink of the cup. And listen to this part. For everyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is all about the together. It's smack right in the middle of all of this about the together. It is the point at which we can come together and consider this, not this. Love and grace together centered around Christ's rescue mission. The Lord's Supper is the ultimate expression of Christ's body, his church. Embracing each other in our desperate need for Jesus to come together. So when you come together, as it says, are we thinking of ourselves or are we thinking of the body? That's verse 29. All of it centered around one thing, the saving grace of Jesus. This alone unites us. So if you know that saving grace, then participate in this. This. If you know that saving grace, 
then participate in this. At the center is Jesus, his saving grace, his amazing grace. His amazing grace that what? That saved a wretch like me. All of us broken. All of us a mess. All of us not need Jesus. That unites us. Whatever differences there are, we are all broken. We are all a mess. We all desperately need Jesus. 